Frank Stillwell is a professor emeritus uh, um, and is a political economist at the University of, of Sydney. And I must say, many people would know you, Frank, and uh, it, it quite often happens that uh, um, you'll be happy to hear that your uh, work there is very fondly remembered by a number of people who say, oh, yes, <laughs> I was uh, um, a student uh, and uh, heard um, some very uh, interesting material, which I learned uh, from Frank Stillwell. But that's just an aside. Um, he, uh, you have worked as a, I've done a little bit of research in diverse fields, including national income accounting, the critique of neoclassical theory, which we're hearing about today, and a development of post Keynesian economics. And this is a big focus. So a lot of work's coming out of that area. Uh, as as uh, many will know, uh, you've taught for over 40 years um, and uh, we hope still going strong uh, um, and you continue to be active. Uh, we very much welcome you and your input uh, as a political economist uh, to our um, uh, online workshop this afternoon. So over to you, Frank. Thanks very much, Matthew. And uh, I'm happy to be here with, with you, uh, albeit as the last speaker b b before lunch. Uh, and I uh, want to try and tie together some of the themes that have already emerged in, in this morning's discussion. Uh, we began with very interesting presentations from uh, Hayden and Phil on the uh, economic ideas, uh, particularly the dysfunctional character of mainstream economics, often labelled neoclassical economics, when looked at for, particularly from a, a, an ecological perspective. Um, and, and Stephen Hale's critique of conventional views of money and finance I think also was a useful supplement in giving a very effective focus on myths of, about the money and financial system that impede uh, government policies and, and uh, progressive uh, futures. Um, I wish it were true that exposing these myths and rejecting mainstream economic thinking would change the world. I've spent my whole professional career, now 50 years, uh, um, in banging away on these issues about the, the limits of conventional economic thinking and the problems that result from that. But it's now my considered opinion, uh, <laughs> in fact, evolving over that time, that economic theory doesn't actually drive how the real world works. Economic interests do that. Uh, and under a capitalist economy, that means business interests pursuing higher profits and workers seeking to claw back some of that economic surplus in the form of higher wages so that they can engage in higher levels of consumption or simply manage to keep treading water in a world where housing and other basic necessities become increasingly unaffordable. These are the material economic interests that drive the processes of economic growth. What neoclassical economics does is to provide a leg legitimizing ideology. It's not itself the driver. Capitalist economic interests, the material interests in the society as it's currently structured are the drivers of economic growth and environmental decay. A critique of the theory, therefore, helps to delegitimize this system, but it doesn't directly change it. To make change, we've got to get down and dirty. We've got to get out of the seminar room or the Zoom meeting uh, and into the political economic institutions that run this show. As ever, to make effective social change requires four things. Critique, vision, strategy, and organization. People around the steady state economy movement, in my perception, are very strong on critique uh, of, of neoclassical theory, of uh, the problems arising from a gobble gobble growth economy. Strong on vision, too, 
of a more sustainable future, a, a steady state economy that would live more harmoniously, people with people, people with nature, in perpetuity, in principle at least. But weak on strategy, getting how to get from the unacceptable present to the desired future is not something that's well articulated and uh, focused. An organization is, of course, uh, lamentably weak. Sometimes there's a, it seems there's an implicit assumption that we have to change our thinking, therefore our actions, and that, that educational events like today's will help to push that process along. Well, maybe, I, I mean, this is helpful, of course, uh, but I think we've got to go beyond that because making change is always a struggle through the institutions. As Karl Marx said, uh, people make history, but not in conditions of their own choosing. And in this circumstance, it means we've got to work in the existing capitalist economy, in the existing consumerist society, in the globally integrated capitalism uh, in which we live. And the immediate task is to identify a feasible starting point for an effective transition to ecological sustainability. Uh, as um, Rob, uh, Noam Chomsky and Robert Pullen put it in their latest book on climate crisis and the global Green New Deal, we have to work within the current economic and political institutional environment because the climate crisis is so pressing we can't wait for some more long-term transformation of our political economic arrangements first. We've got to start the process in the here and now. Now that means collective action. Sure, we can do a lot in terms of in individual action of living more in harmony with each other and with nature. But if we're to have effective collective action for societal change, this means working through institutions, particularly the state, because the state has that potential to be responsive to democratic processes. Um, unlike the interests of corporate capital, which are responsive only to the interests of the managers of corporate capital and the shareholders in the businesses to which they run. The state, it seems to me, for all its deficiencies, is the vehicle through which we can have strong uh, change to the rules of the game and strong initiatives that would take us in a different direction. No, that's not going to happen necessarily. It's a political struggle. Uh, on the right are the forces of fossil fuel authoritarianism who want to maintain effectively the status quo that serve their material interests. On the other extreme, there are the advocates of uh, ecological socialism, and uh, I would include myself among them uh, because uh, in the long term, that is the sort of equitable and sustainable society we need to be working towards. But it's inconceivable that we can have it now. The political preconditions are not present. Uh, if if a, a government uh, or political party were to offer itself at the forthcoming election, uh, making a case for ecological socialism, it would get almost no votes. So here is the paradox. We have to work through institutions that are democratic, but for goals that are not currently supported by sufficient people who are understandably uh, more directly concerned with keeping their current job, whether it's as a minor or whatever, and uh, paying, paying the rent and putting a roof over their head. This is the tension we have to work with. And I think the circuit breaker is the, the advocacy of a Green New Deal. Now, this is a notion that got uh, quite popular around the time of the global financial crash. Um, the, green, uh, the, the New Economic Foundation in the UK, uh, in particular their chief economist, Anne Pettifor, was an articulate spokesperson for this 
uh, alternative agenda. Although I think looking back, one can see that in the UK, earlier publications such as the new economic agenda that was put out uh, back in the 1970s, uh, paved the way for this kind of uh, work. Uh, the report of the World Watch Institute pushed it along. And as we know, in American politics, uh, uh, the Congresswoman uh, Alexandra Casio Cortez, AOC, has been uh, advocating a Green New Deal for a long time. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren took it up in the last round of uh, Democratic uh, Party presidential uh, primaries. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, Noam Chomsky and Robert Pullen uh, are pushing it in, in uh, an important book that has recently been published. According to Chomsky and Pollen, there are four goals. Of course, first and foremost, reducing greenhouse gas emissions to meet the IPCC targets. Secondly, making dramatic improvements in energy efficiency and expanding the supply of solar, wind and other renewable energy resources. Arguably, this is an attempt to decouple growth from ecological damage. It doesn't mean that ecological damage would diminish uh, rapidly or certainly not overnight, but it would mean at least a relative decoupling of growth from uh, the ecological damage that has resulted from its reliance on uh, a degrading technology uh, such as fossil fuels for, for energy. Thirdly, uh, is the equity element to which you referred in your introduction, Matthew, that uh, it's important that this happens in a fair way. Workers who lose their jobs in the fossil fuel industries need to be provided with alternative employment in other green sectors. In other words, here's the, the, the shift, a transition to green jobs. Uh, which will prevent the, or at least obviate, the anxieties of joblessness and uh, economic insecurity. And then finally, uh, unifying climate stabilization with the goals of the expanding opportunities in order to raise living standards for working people and the poor throughout the world. Now, couched in those terms, the GND or Global uh, Green New Deal is an essentially global project, but to attain the goal, progress must come through policies enacted within individual state jurisdictions, taking account of local conditions and possibilities. And Australia is well placed to embrace a Green New Deal. Uh, jobs, job creation in uh, green job creation, uh, to phase down the, the sunset industries, investment in, in new sectors around renewable energy, the, the, the range of sectors in which progress could be made is enormous. We're talking about uh, more energy efficient transport, improved waste management and recycling, water infrastructure, sustainable agricultural practices, green building design and retrofitting, urban design to, to uh, develop more ecologically sustainable forms of habitat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no shortage of policies that could help to produce this tra transition. And as for the just el transition element, well, that too is actually quite feasible because uh, um, education, training for uh, different uh, growth occupations uh, is within the capacity of governments to provide. Uh, restructured TAFE arrangements, working in conjunction with uh, regions where uh, the required structural economic changes are, are significant would be particularly potent here. Um, but also, I think it's important to emphasize that within a Green New Deal, we're talking not just about top down initiatives, we're talking about uh, empowering people from the bottom up, regional economic forums in which 
people in, in particular localities with which they identify can get together to identify what, what can and should be done within their locality. So we're not talking about something that's just formulated in Canberra and uh, dispatched out in some disaggregated form to the regions. We're talking about some elements of regional autonomy that could be potentially empowering. As of course, could the engagement with indigenous peoples uh, about which uh, Mary and uh, uh, Michelle were, were talking earlier uh, this morning. Very important element. Indeed, when the Australian Greens first embraced the notion of a Green New Deal, the then leader of the party put particular emphasis on the Indigenous engagement element uh, in, in making the case for a Green New Deal in, in Australia. Indeed, here in Australia, we have Indigenous people who have sustainability credentials second to none on the planet, having lived uh, for six, 60,000 years or more uh, in an enduring relationship with nature. So what then are the political possibilities? Well, we've got uh, uh, a federal election looming. Um, there's nothing on the table at the moment. The policies of the major political parties are conspicuously lacking in any of the sort of commitments that I've just described. This is regrettable, but it's not uh, all over. The, the Greens are certainly pushing this line and some of the progressive independents are too. And a feasible electoral scenario is that a Labour government comes to power with the support of Greens and progressive independents, and that leads to significant negotiations around something that starts to look like a Green New Deal. Now, I pause to say, I wouldn't be surprised if some uh, steady state economy proponents would not be terribly enthusiastic about this because a Green New Deal doesn't take us immediately off the growth treadmill. It just says we want to get onto a green growth path involving some uh, partial decoupling from environmentally degrading technologies. So it doesn't immediately deliver even if uh, some such coalition could bring its support and get some kind of uh, cooperation from the business sector, the trade union movement and so on, it wouldn't give us what I think we all want. But it would be a step. And as such, I consider myself in advocating this to be a climate pragmatist rather than a climate idealist. But life is short. Um, the, uh, the time scale for climate change is very pressing and we just have to get started. And it seems to me that if we think of a Green New Deal in that way, as the first step in a longer term transition, it would open up the political economic possibilities for subsequent steps. It would open up some opportunities for capitalists to make profits for a start uh, by investing in these sunrise industries and getting out of their, their stranded assets in, in sunset industry. It would provide, I think, some in, or potential enthusiasm among the, uh, the union movement and the workforce more generally about new employment opportunities. In other words, there's a political element in promising a different form of growth rather than a cessation of growth that has a, a strong economic and social roots and would, uh, I think, help to create a coalition to make things actually get underway. And having got underway, then the struggle begins to steer the program uh, left or right, to steer it to a more uh, sustainable uh, steady state future, or alternatively to claw it back towards the sort of uh, uh, 
piecemeal and incoherent program that the powerful interests within the carbon club would clearly prefer. Um, the world is full of political struggle. Our task, it seems to me, is to change the, or get started on a new direction. It doesn't necessarily take us to where we wanna be eventually, but uh, unless some such change occurs in the near future, I fear climate uh, disaster is, is looming and we will all be uh, accountable for what remains of civilization for our failure. Do we want to have a few more questions? Because I, I suspect Frank may have um, ignited some, some interest. <laughs> I have a question if there's time. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I was, we're going to break a little bit earlier, but um, it seems to me that strike while the iron's hot, so go. Um, quickly, so thank you, Frank. That was excellent as always, and a really good reminder for people like me who are kind of trying to create activist spaces deeply informed by knowledgeable people. Um, <clears throat> two questions. The Green New Deal is obviously not on the radar this election. Um, if we, if a bunch of us, uh, there's many, many, many of us, we're, <laughs> there's any time left for the next election or the state elections, um, wanted to activate some of this or try to push it. My, my question is Green New Deal and New Deal, Aussies seem to react to that as an American thing. So I, I think the framing of it is very useful to just sort of the same way that Green Prince harnesses sort of the bioregional community angle, a framing helps bring the stuff together. But I've had, <laughs> I've had people push back that the New Deal is American. And, you know, it emerged after the, was it during the Depression, the first New Deal and then the Green New Deal? So are there any Australian examples where we got our act together and can we reframe it so that it's something that even the green printers could really push as an extension of community saying, we're going to do all this locally and now it's time to really push into our politicians a shared framework for the future. And I think Mary Graham's sort of relational economics, um, relational everything. But what do you think, Frank? Uh, certainly the terminology itself is American. The, the original New Deal was that uh, initiated by uh, F.D. Roosevelt, President of the United States during the period of the Great Depression. There was a tremendous uh, unemployment rate, uh, 20 to 30 percent. Um, social discontent had to be addressed by government provision of job creation programs, some of which were ecologically oriented. Uh, tree planting in areas where there was a sort of great dust bowl and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, the, the, so the use of that terminology resonates very strongly in, in the United States. Uh, um, look, terminology doesn't matter that much, uh, I think. Um, in, in some people talk about it as the real deal in, in Australia. Some people within the Labour Party, uh, before this election campaign got underway, we're talking about the need for a jobs and climate accord, uh, harking back to Labour Party policies of the 1980s, uh, but in this case, reoriented ar around uh, ecological and economic sustainability. Um, Jenny Macklin, for example, wrote an article in a book about the need for a jobs and climate accord. Um, she's one of the senior Labour luminaries. Um, so I, 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 th I think uh, the ideas uh, aren't uniquely American. The terminology needs to be uh, whatever appeals most to an Australian audience. And I think that notion of a, a jobs and climate accord is probably with an eye to getting the Labour Party on side and not seeing it as just another uh, assault by the Greens political party on its left flank, which of course is, is a worry for many people in, in, in the Labour Party. They see the Greens as not as, as hovering around to take their seats. Um, uh, if we can only get a stronger accommodation between Greens and Labour around some agreed terminology, around some agreed process of actually working together, 
uh, after the woeful decade we've just had, uh, I mean, oh, I'm going to... That's post. actually why I asked the question, because although you, on the one hand you say framing doesn't matter, it actually really matters. And if we, it's not that we have to play with words, but having a framing that, that is more inclusive yeah, um, absolutely. And not just green. Uh, we use green prints because we're working with early adopters. This ain't for the folk who don't care. Yeah. But I think Australia needs its own political framings. Um, yeah, thank you, Frank. I appreciate yeah. your sure. answer. In, in, in Labour circles, the word green is, is, is a bit iffy, you know, because of that political rivalry. But uh, we've, got, we've got to try to get beyond that. And if terminology helps, then, then whatever it takes. Well, thank, thanks, Frank, for um, your end note, uh, suggesting that, um, you know, if we don't get our act together, we have catastrophe. I'd like to say that my parents, grew, they grew up during the First World War with no hope of owning a home. And by the Second World War, they owned a home. They were buying a home. Impossible. They never, ever expected it. And it was a big surprise to them for the rest of their lives. Um, such a change. Now, what brought about that? Catastrophe. Uh, First World War, flu pandemic, Great Depression and fear of communism. Now, I don't see us going from vision to, to uh, action without having the legs taken out from underneath the feet of the plutocracy. And um, I, I think the only, and now they were, they were taken out for a number of decades, and then they took over in, with neoliberalism. Now, I think what will really take the legs out from under them is climate catastrophe. Uh, and I, I'd love to know how that's going to be avoided, but I, personally, I don't see how it's happening, but I'm very interested to know how our discussion develops as to how we might avoid it. Yeah, I, I love your analysis, Jim, but uh, I'm not sure about the prescription. Uh, uh, economic catastrophe and climate catastrophe are different animals. Economic catastrophe you can recover from. You know, the whole history of capitalism is a history of booms and slumps. You know, you have your recession, then you have your period of economic growth. But ecological catastrophe, as I understand it, is a one-way street. You get irreversible changes, which make uh, bouncing back not a feasible future. So we can't wait for extreme ecological catastrophe. Christ, we've already got enough of it, you know, in terms of bushfires and uh, extreme weather events. Uh, you know, this is a portent of things to come. And I, I would be hopeful that we've already seen enough glimpses that together with, of course, the scientific evidence coming through from the IPCC and elsewhere to, to galvanize action. But where I think your analysis is very astute is the need to take on powerful interests that don't want to relinquish their control over the key economic decisions in society. Uh, Marion Wilkinson's book on, on the Climate Club is a wonderful expose of that, but other writings by, by Richard Dennis, Clive Hamilton, and many others have explored the, the political economic underpinnings of the, the fossil fuel interests, uh, the, the fossil fuel authoritarianism that has increasingly invaded mainstream politics too. Uh, but a struggle against that is not going to be wholly successful in the short term. Keep the eye on, on, on where the power lies and try to work around the, in, in the areas in which we can make progress. And I, I, even though I think that the, the Labour Party is, is a, not an inspiring avenue through which to do this, it does at least open up some possibilities for a new government to at least make a partial change of direction, which then other more progressive social forces can uh, pile into and try to get more effective change. So ultimately curtailing the power 
of corporate capital, through regulation, through uh, public enterprise, through the development of alternative business models around cooperatives. All of these things could help to, to grasp or expand the, the range of political, uh, practical political economic opportunities. We need to struggle in so many fields to make this happen. Thanks, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Um, I might just say briefly, Frank, that no, it doesn't give me indigestion what you're saying, because as an activist for four decades or more, you do what you can and you do what works. And while I'm an advocate with the steady state economy, as we, and when we talked about in the conclusion of the book, Ecological Economic Solutions for the Future, that uh, if, if the Green New Deal can actually accelerate climate action, then yeah, let's go for it. The only thing I'll say is had a look at the Greens policy on economics the other day and they're supporting a circular economy. I couldn't see a Green New Deal mentioned. So, yeah. But that's yeah. Back to anybody. I mean, uh, just in terms of framing, you can see these elements. For instance, uh, during the excellent um, uh, seminar held back in uh, 2019 on sustainable prosperity. One of the uh, things that were meant, there were union people there. And uh, one of the things that was talked about in terms of a change in, air, in industries such as the coal mining industry and coal export, etc., was just transition. Does anyone have anything else or uh, uh, just at the moment? We can break for lunch, but um, is there something that um, someone wanted to? Um, I've got a question I'd like to ask. Um, I'm sorry to have missed part of this morning, although the first couple of talks that I heard I thought were terrific. But and, and speaking as an, a non-economist, I just want to quote Robert Costanza, who said in 2000, the most critical task facing humanity today is the creation of a shared vision of a sustainable and desirable society. Um, sometimes, I mean, there are some important people in, on the planet who seem to share that sort of vision. I mean, is that the sort of vision that you all share or economists share? Or would it be reworded a bit with some more economics in it? Um, so I, I just wondered what our speakers or other people thought about that claim from Costanza. Um, the most critical task, he said. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that, Alan, because uh, I mean, it seems to me that it's almost the bleeding obvious. That, well, it is, uh, if, isn't it? If, 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 if we can't get to there, then, then you know, what, there's, there's no hope. It's just uh, we don't seem to be getting, nothing seems to be getting implemented in that sort of direction. And I, I, I guess it may be that a lot more people, a lot more humans on the planet are starting to get really, really worried about climate. But on the other hand, if you also value democracy, which I do, it seems to me that politicians are still appealing to the short term hip pocket and, and still winning out. Yeah, it, it, it is an obvious tension, uh, but uh, Both is good. Uh, at least in the realm of rhetoric, you know, one can't be opposed to sustainability. Capitalists want sustainability. They want a world in which they can carry on making profits forevermore. Um, governments want a, a sustainable world in which they'll get elected, re-elected and so forth. Uh, uh, the, in, the, the task is to translate that sort of comfortable rhetoric into effective action. Now, I, I think what uh, uh, has been said earlier by Mary in particular and Michelle ab about a, a new environmental ethics is a very important element here. I mean, at the moment, uh, uh, the question of ethics and corruption is, is in the spotlight in the Australian context, you know, because politicians are, are obviously acting in ways that are corrupt and unethical and won't agree to setting up, a, or at least on the conservative side, an integrity commission and so on. Um, 
uh, a broader notion of ethics that includes our relationships with each other, with nature, with the land, the issues that Mary and, and Michelle both emphasized would help, I think, to bridge that connection between the, the sort of the rhetorical commitment to uh, sustainability and practical action to, act, to, to, to do things uh, that, that will make a difference. Well, that's the problem. And Frank, is it is it necessary for a capitalist economy to have growth? Is growth a necessity? Well, it's an inevitable driver uh, resulting from the pursuit of capitalist interests. If you want to make profits, you expand the investment opportunities from which you can uh, derive uh, that, that economic surplus. You want capitalists, to will, capitalists will always drive uh, capital accumulation and economic growth. Uh, the question is, what's the rules of the game within which they're allowed to operate? And it's governments that set the rules of the game. That's right. I mean, can, can a capitalist economy also be steady state? If there are sufficient regulations uh, to limit the uh, capital accumulation process, limit the ways in which profits can be made. I mean, if, if, if governments say there can be no coal mine, just in the same way as governments say you can't drive your car on the right hand side of the road, uh, then that avenue for capital accumulation, that form of economic growth gets closed off. So is, is regulation an essential part of a Green New Deal? Uh, yes, some things have to be prohibited because they're ecologically unsustainable. Um, uh, other things can be in encouraged through uh, changing price systems, carbon taxes and oh. subsidies for ecologically sustainable industries can all play a, a part in, in that process too. So it doesn't have to be all the eggs in the, the regulation basket. Yeah. There can be some eggs in the, what you might call the economic incentives basket too. But in both cases, the intention is to change behavior from that which capitalists would normally engage in into activities where they can still try to make profits, but within the bounds set by government.